secure the bag. And uh, how many of you um, have uh, appreciated, learned some things through this series? Just give me a little head nod, okay, everybody, yeah? Uh, I certainly have, even as I've been studying it. And what we're make, what our goal, what our main theme is, is we are acquiring or keeping something of value. And so what we're saying is, is money is not necessarily bad and to acquire or keep it or even to see it as valuable uh, isn't a bad thing. And so I want you to feel okay with that as you build wealth for generations, as you are generous, having resources, not a bad thing. What happens is when we obsess over or love these things, that's when we run into problems. Now, how many of you have been in a bad breakup? Anybody bad breakup? Every single person in Center City, probably. (laughs) I'm just kidding, I don't know. Bad breakup. So, I mean, there's a difference between good breakups and bad breakups. Now, all breakups are painful, right? I mean, it's hard. You invest a lot, right? So, but, but like, there's a difference. Like, a good breakup is when, you know, you know it, it's mutual. You understand. You, you're cool. Uh, it, it's cordial. It, it hurts. But, like, we know this is the best thing. And we didn't ruin everybody's reputation and kill each other while we're ending, right? Bad breakups, on the other hand, okay? You might be sitting next to that bad breakup. That's a bad breakup because you're still sitting next to each other. Ah. Okay, like it's like we're still texting each other even though we've been broken up for three months. We've gone on 14 breaks, okay? All right, we are, when we're lonely, we text each other and we do all sorts of things like, you know, we don't follow each other on social media, but we still pay attention. Don't you know we can see you reading our stories? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, those are bad breakups, really horrible, really painful. If you want to learn more about relationships, you can buy my book on Amazon called Level Up or The Merch Table. Okay. All right. But I say all that to say this. Some of us have a very bad relationship with money. But we have a really tumultuous, dangerous, painful, sorrowful relationship with money, and we need to break up with her. We need to break up with him. We need to break up with it. Now, I'm not saying that we should break up with money in and of itself, but there are spirits that rest on money that we need to break up with. And so today, I want to teach a message to all of you that I'm breaking up with my money. Breaking up with my money. And what I mean by that is is the idea and the principle that this is all mine and I'm connected to and committed to the spirits that rest on this money. I'm breaking up with my money. So at every location, look at somebody next to you and tell them, I'm breaking up with my money, with my money. Make that declaration. My money. Some of you are weary in doing that because you're like, well, I don't want to. He's going he's gonna to make me give all my money today. Like that. These spirits that are on money. That's what we're talking about. Now, I want to I talk to you about three spirits today that rest on money that we need to break up with. One of them I've spoken about before, the others that I haven't. Uh, and so, but I have to go to 1 Timothy first. And it is a conversation that Paul writes Timothy, his spiritual son. And he says this, he says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Got to stop right there. Listen to me. Paul is not writing to people who are already rich. He's writing to people who are obsessed with becoming rich. Okay. He's saying when you are obsessed with, when you lust over it, when you desire it, when all you think about is starting things and doing things and scheming to get money, you're falling into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Don't you love that word perdition? I wish that I would just say that more often. You're like, what does that mean? For the love of money is a root. Like like if your life is a root system, the love of money is a bad root that's spoiling the rest of the tree of your life. Of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Many sorrows. So I want to make a statement. Stay with me right here. Look, money is not evil. It is neutral or amoral. Okay, it's not evil. It's neutral. You can do good with it 
or bad with it. However, there is a spirit or spirits attached to money that we need to break free from. So let's repeat, let's see it, let's say it again, let's understand it. Money in and of itself is not easy. It's neutral or amoral. You can do good with it or bad with it. However, there is a spirit or spirits attached to money that we need to break free from. I need to break up with my money. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right, so what are the three spirits? Here's the first one. We need to break up with the spirit of mammon. Mammon. Ever heard that word before? Mammon. Okay. Uh, mammon is an Aramaic word meaning riches. It comes from the Syrian God of riches. Let's go to the scriptures, Luke chapter 16. Jesus talking. He says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Amen. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, love those. Those are important. Therefore, pay attention. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? We're going to come back to that. Okay. Next slide. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? We'll come back to that. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. So many people think that Jesus is saying you can't serve God and money. And in a sense, we can't serve God and anything else. God desires all of our attention, all of our focus. He desires all of us, everything in us, right? You understand, like, God is always going to be first, whether you make him first or not. He desires it all. So, of course, we can't serve God and sports. We can't serve God and this or God and that. But he's making a statement, and it's the only place in the scripture where he draws the line in the sand like this, where he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Well, Jesus wasn't referring to riches. He was referring to a false god that they knew about, the Syrian god. And it comes from Babylon. Have you heard of Babylon? Okay. In other words, here's, here's what Babylon was. Okay. Pay attention for a moment. The people started to build a tower, a building, so that they could reach the heavens or go further than the heavens. They wanted to go high, as high up as possible. They wanted to prove that they were as good or as talented that they didn't need God to get them to the heavens. So what happened is, is God was like, no, I'm not playing that. I I'm first. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to confuse you. So the word babel means confusion. And if you take the word, the suffix on, Babylon, it means planted in. So Babylon means planted or sown in confusion. Okay, and so this idea, this spirit that Jesus was referencing was not necessarily money. It was this idea that when I think that I'm greater than or I don't need God, I'm going to confuse my life. Wow. It's, it's a spirit of Babylon. It's a spirit that thinks it can surpass God. So this is what mammon is. We don't need God if we have riches and money. It's arrogant and it's prideful, and it tries to replace God by our own work and accomplishments. That's the spirit of mammon that rests on so many of us and so much of our money. Have you heard of the prosperity gospel, anybody? It's this idea and this principle that if I name it and claim it, it'll be mine. I like to say if I blab it and grab it, I can have it. <laughs> right, okay, so like, let me be clear. There is much importance in our declarations of faith. But, but let me help you decipher the two. Can I teach you for a moment? 
the, the idea that prosperity gospel will say all we should have is health and wealth. If we just declare it and name it and claim it, then that's all we'll have. Like today, if I declare that there will be a nice Corvette or what, what do you want? Just come on, talk to me. Somebody, Center City, what do you want? A Tesla. Okay. Why do you want a Tesla? Like, where are you going to find somewhere to plug that in? Okay. A, a, a Ranger, a helicopter. I don't know what you want a Range Rover. Okay. I'm just going to declare and say that that's going to be in my driveway that many of us don't even have when I get home from church. And then when it's not there, what happens? God, why did you forsake me? Where is my stuff? See, see, God will use, listen to me, God will use calamity and trouble and even pain he might allow to take you through a storm and it might be good for you. Yes. Right? It absolutely might be good for you. And sometimes we make bad decisions and cause pain for ourselves, but God will still use it for his glory and for your good. So there's a difference between going, okay, because we do have to declare things in faith. We do have to call things that are not as though they are. Like if your marriage is really bad or your kids are maniacs or your health is not good, it's important for us to acknowledge what is. Because if we're not honest and we don't acknowledge, then God can't fix the problem. So maybe what the prosperity gospel might do is there is no problem. Everything's good. I just declare all the things are mine. All the things are mine. But what we have to do is say, my marriage isn't what it should be right now. And my kids are a little crazy and not where I know they're meant to be. Or my job situation or my home situation or there's a leak in my house. But I serve an everlasting, unbelievable God. Uh, I serve a God that triumphs and provides victory. I serve a God that's never failed me yet. I serve a God that owes it all, owns it all. I serve a God that heals and delivers and changes and redeems. So I do declare in Jesus' name that my marriage is not where it could be, but one day it will be there and I'll do what it takes to move it there. Do you understand the difference? we got to speak out in faith. My, my, speak life over our kids. I love my child. I love you, son or daughter. You're, you're going to make it. You, you are intelligent. You, you do have, right? We don't have to lie to them and say that they're great at soccer when they're not. But maybe they're great at dance or art and like just shift it. And declare that, God, I, that God's made you to be creative. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but, the, but the, the spirit of mammon will say, when God doesn't deliver, God is false. Wow. You're the one who delivers. Wow. You're the one who takes care of you. Yeah. You worked hard. You got the degree. You made yourself the raise. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The spirit of mammon is dangerous. It's saying, if I had more money, people would listen to me. It promises significance. The spirit of mammon says, if I have the right clothes or the right house or more money, I'd be happier and somebody would date me. That's not why they're date, not dating you. Okay? Because you're using organic deodorant that doesn't work. <laughs> Just kidding. If, if you had no use it, God bless you, cancer free. If, if you had more money, you could help more people. That's a lie. That's the spirit of man and lying. I got to keep more so that I can help more. It's not money that helps people. It's God who helps people and he uses faithful people. Yes. I either need God to come through or I need someone to give me money. Have you ever said that before? If someone would just give me money, all my problems would be solved, and God will serve you all the days of my life. Like, like that's the spirit of mammon talking. And you know the spirit of mammon talks. You can hear it when we pull out the offering buckets and we take an offering. <laughs> oh, here they go, asking for an offering again. Light's been on all every time I've been here. What do they need money for? <laughs> the spirit of mammon is a liar. And promises you things that it cannot fill and it cannot deliver. And momentary satisfaction is all the spirit of mammon can give. But God gives us peace and life. And we will fail and we will mess up and we will miss it. And we will make mistakes and we'll curse. and we'll. But God forgives and he redeems. And those who confess their sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. 
He satisfies my weary soul. <laughs> Got to break the spirit of mammon off our life. How do we do it? Here's how we break it. Here's how we redeem our money. We know this first and foremost, the 10% back through the house of God. Our money is redeemed when we return. Remember the tithe is returning, it's not giving. Secondly, we determine that money is not a solution to security. Period, the end. Number three, we acknowledge that we can't take it to the grave. <laughs> Lastly, we can't be frivolous with money. We stewardship over stress. That is how we redeem our resources. 10% to the house of God. We determine that money is not a source of our security. We acknowledge we can't take it to the grave. We are not frivolous. We stewardship over stress. Right. You want to break the spirit off your life. This is how we do it. You want to break the spirit off your money because your money is getting passed through many hands. And it's natural for us to listen to a loud voice that's lying. Yes. Have you noticed? Have you noticed in scenarios, like, it's the, it's, the, it's the bad or the annoying or the lying voices that seem louder, and you feel like there's just a million of them, but sometimes it's just less, but they're louder? We've got to lean in and say, Spirit of God, speak. Your servant is listening. Yes. Got to break the spirit of mammon. Here's the second one. We've got to break the spirit of entitlement. Now, stay with me before you turn me off, Center City. Stay with me. Okay? Spirit of entitlement. Here's what it means. Entitlement is the belief that I have a right to everything. And if others have something, well, I should have it too. It's also, listen, it's also, I'm entitled to opportunities and resources. And if I have it, I throw my nose up and say, you shouldn't have it. Do you understand? That's what entitlement is. This is not necessarily a kingdom principle. Now I would associate this spirit with greed I would associate this spirit with witchcraft, this, this spirit, this idea of control. How dare me not have what everybody else has? It's pride, it's arrogance, it's entitlement. I want to go gently, stay with me. In other words, I deserve, so I need to be taken care of. Or I have it, so I need to spend to keep it up. Uh, entitlement is, in a sense, it's just, it's paycheck rich. It's on Friday, I get paid, and by Saturday, I'm broke again. Because I can't wait to get the new pair of shoes so I can take a picture so I can get 31 likes on Instagram. And if I don't get that many likes, then it was a colossal failure. And I take it back and find another pair of shoes and even spend more money so that I can get my 31 likes. Entitlement is like, I've got to have this because everybody else has it. Entitlement is like, I, I have to have Disney Plus because everyone in the world has Disney Plus and my kids are not going to survive if they cannot sing every single song of the Frozen soundtrack. <laughs> Nobody wants to build a snowman. <laughs> Pass us by. <laughs> Right, and like this is a time where it's like I gotta do everything I can to keep up with everybody else to make sure I'm good to take care of me. I earned it. And while there's nothing wrong with self-care, and it is important, and there's nothing wrong with having things and even having nice things when it's out of order and when it's at the potential of hurting yourself and your future, and when you are obsessed with those things, that's when it's dangerous. There's something wrong with being broke when you don't have to be. Wow. There's something wrong with loving material things a lot, too much. There's something wrong with worshiping self-security and personal gain so that you're happy. If you're only happy when you open up a gift, if you're only happy when you have a new car, if you're only happy when money buys you something, you have a spirit of entitlement that's got to break off your dollar. That's not what brings peace. There are a lot of wealthy people who are happy and at peace, but there are also a lot of wealthy people who are not. And they've learned that one more item doesn't do the trick. And learned that welcoming people and being generous is the answer. The kingdom of God is not about being entitled. It's about being selfless. Stay with me. 
Stay with me. Listen to me. It's not about being entitled. It's about being selfless. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it for my sake. Period. The end. Now, I want to be clear about something, please. I understand the challenges of our society. I understand the imperfections of our nation at times. I understand the brokenness of our world. I acknowledge income gaps and elements of systemic racism in our society. I understand generational poverty that exists. I'm not suggesting these things don't exist. But I am still telling you that there's a spirit of entitlement that will affect the way that you live, your attitude towards wealth and money. And no matter where you are on the spectrum of life and what you've experienced, if you don't break from that spirit, it will affect your future. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Lean in, lean in, hear this. You may have been dealt an inadequate deck of cards, but in God's economy, you can still win with that hand. It starts with ignoring the noises that the spirit of entitlement makes. Let me say it again for the person who's fighting this and is wrapped up in some form of identity that's not the things of God. You may have been dealt an inadequate deck of cards and I understand that that's challenging, hard, and painful, but you're in God's economy, not the world's economy. And if God wants to use you, favor rests on the faithful. God is looking for people to bless, and God doesn't care where you come from. He's looking for people who will be faithful. Now, I want to show you this spirit at work. This is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is the son who takes his wealth from his father and goes. Meanwhile, the older son who stayed was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother's back. He was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Amen. But the older brother was petty and entitled. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. Come on. I mean, his brother's back. We thought he was dead. We thought he was gone. But he's worried about himself. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you, dad, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one little measly goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Stay there for a minute. Go back, go back, go back. Think about this. The son is mad, but we forget that the son who squandered his wealth was putting his head in a pig's pen, eating after the pigs. Now, dad may not have thrown a party for his friends, but maybe the son never asked. At the same time, the son never went without a meal. Keep that in mind. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing a fattened calf. Next slide. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Good news. Good news, right? I mean, good news, Center City, right? But so many of us see other people win, and it's bad news for us. That's the spirit of entitlement. The spirit of entitlement misses the point that it's good when others win. It also forces us to compare, point fingers, and forget we have opportunities to accomplish what God has asked of us and called us to, you and I. The spirit of entitlement, it's pointing fingers. It's saying, oh, I don't have what they have. I didn't get what they got. Or it's saying, they shouldn't have what I have. See, it goes both ways. I want to illustrate this for a moment. I brought some money with me today. I got got some money bags. And uh, by the way, that's how you catch a football. God help us. 
And uh, I got some money in here. Now, the Lord, he distributes gifts, resources, even finance, according to our ability to catch, keep, and give away, to invest. And today, I would love to give some free money away. Does anybody want some free money? Some free money. Okay, here we go. I'm throwing it, right? I'm dropping it back, setting my feet. I'm looking, and I found a... No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> so here's the rules of my game today, all right? The rules of my game are this. I need your money bags back. So bring them to the altar after service. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name, and leave them here. But you can have what's inside. What is inside of the money bags today? I've got a $50 bill, amen. I've got a $20 bill and a $10 bill. It's yours. It's yours to do what? Well, what I would love for you to do is I would love for you to be a good and faithful steward and use your abilities to do what God's asked you to do. And let's just pretend that I'm playing God because as the preacher, I'm believing God's speaking through me prophetically to you. As an illustration, if you got 50, well, go buy a good toy for somebody in Jesus' name. Go give them a block card and invite them to church. If you got a 20, go take somebody out to lunch in Jesus' name, right? Give them a block card, invite them. Ooh, if you got a 10, take somebody to coffee in Jesus' name. Give them a block card. Amen. Sound good, right? Yeah. But the spirit of entitlement says, I got up today, and did you see the weather? It's cold. And I came to church, and I put on clothes, and I got the kids ready. I even fed myself turkey sausage today. I'm healthy. I skip the bread. Right? I got here. I'm sitting in potentially an uncomfortable pew, chair, metal chair. I'm in a cafetorium. I'm in a Jewish temple. I'm in a cater where I don't even know where I am. And I got here. Look what I did. And I need some money. And it just fell from the sky. Thank you, Lord. It's for me. Right? right? That's what the spirit of entitlement says. And like the idea of giving this away. No, this is mine. I got this. I need this. And the spirit of entitlement does that. It says, you know, I work for this, but can I remind you that yes, you were faithful and worked hard and pushed through, but it was God who got you up and allowed your heart to beat. It was God who allowed you to make the food that you had and put the food in your refrigerator. It was God who allowed you to put your clothes on and actually give you clothes to put on your back who got you where you went safely. Whether it was by subway, bus, car, walking, you got there. It's God who is the source of all things. And when something comes to us, we must steward it by recognizing it's not mine in the first place. And the spirit of entitlement will say it's yours. It's yours, but it's not. It's mine to steward. It's mine to manage. Here's another thing that the, steward, the spirit of entitlement will do. It will say, why did they get a 50 and I got a 10? How come they got a 20? I don't, I don't even like coffee. And now I got to go take this $10 and give somebody coffee? Why couldn't I get the 50? Why couldn't I? And the spirit of entitlement, it points fingers and it blames. And instead of doing what you've been asked to do with the abilities that God's given you, it's wishing you had what somebody else has. And it's a dangerous place. And then instead of receiving the blessing, what happens, and the scriptures talk about it, Jesus talks about it. When God gives you something, little or small, if you are not faithful with it, it will be taken away and given to the one who actually will be faithful with it. So stop complaining and stop wishing because this ain't Disney and wishes don't come true. Only sowing seeds works in the kingdom of God. And so let's sow, baby, let's sow. And let's see what God will do because God's looking for people who invest and say, God, I trust you. God always takes care of those who take care of the business of the kingdom of God. Listen to me, listen to me, stay with me. Generosity, giving, there's nothing like it. When we give and celebrate others, it will heal wounds in our communities. It will reconcile divided hearts. And it will transform both the giver and the receiver. 
We have got to break the spirit of mammon and the spirit of entitlement. And when we do, I think we can break the spirit of shame. And that's my last point, the spirit of shame. I got to break up with my money. It's his, the spirit of shame. Here's what shame is. Shame often is associated with bad decisions and having experienced the repercussions of those bad decisions. Would you agree with that? Some of us have only known financial struggle. Some of us have only known financial upheaval. Some of us have only known pain and hurt when it comes to money. And sometimes our bad decisions, we were uneducated or unaware, we weren't taught, whatever it was, it led us to a place where we have shame associated. I'm ashamed that I'm in debt. I'm ashamed that I've got these credit card problems. I'm ashamed I don't even know how much my student loans are. I'm ashamed I got shame associated with money. And what I would say to you today is you don't have to live in shame no matter what your circumstance is. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new is here. And we're in it together. But what happens when we are shameful, and it's a form of pride, is we practice denial. And when we practice denial, we can never get to the bottom of the problem, so then we can't solve it. So those of us who carry shame often refuse to acknowledge that there really is an issue with my money, and until we know the facts, we can't fix the issue. And so we must break the spirit of shame when it comes to our money and just say, this is it. I've got $4 million in student debt, and that's what it is, and only God can do the miracle as long as I work with them. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Like, I've got 46 credit cards, and 14 of them are in my name, and they're split with two other people. Whatever it is, however bad it is, name it and own it. It's the only way to bring it into the light so God can deal with it. For clarity, I do not have $4 million in student debt or 46 credit cards. Amen. For just a couple minutes, let's break shame together. We have to go to the scriptures. And I'm almost done. But the Bible says he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. Shame often comes when we're faithful, when we're not faithful with little. We go, I don't have much. And so we squander what little we have and then we get in debt because of it or we get angry because of it, or we get frustrated because of it. The way to break shame is to be faithful, is to acknowledge and say, this is where I'm at, this is what I have. I'm gonna be faithful with what little I have, and I'm not gonna be afraid, and I'm not gonna be ashamed. And guess what? We can't have all the bells and whistles, and I'm not gonna drive the fancy car, and I might have a lot of loans, and a lot of things that I'm dealing with and working through, but I'm gonna be faithful to God with little. And then he promises that eventually I'll have more. But shame never lets us have more because we're stuck on what little we have. Second scripture. It says, if you've not been faithful with what is another man's, you won't be faithful with your own. And what happens, shame will say, well, I've, I've got nothing together, so why should I help somebody else have it together? And what we do then is we steal from our company. We steal from our job. We spend too much time on social media instead of making a sale. We do this, we do that, and we're not faithful. We cheat the system, we cheat the structure, all of these different things, and shame gets associated with it. But what the scriptures say, you got to be faithful with unrighteous mammon before you can be faithful with your own stuff. If you're not faithful to be generous now, what makes you think when you're given more or when you have more that you'll be faithful and generous and steward what you've been given? No, you'll just end up being paycheck rich. Then the last scripture says, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? True riches. What are true riches? True riches are people the most important commodity. Jesus did not come to die for money or wealth. He came to die for humans. Can I paint a picture for you for a moment? Do you remember when Jesus came and he was tempted by the devil? Right before his ministry, he goes on a 40-day fast and then the devil tempts him. 
And the devil says, Jesus, you're here. I'm here. I know you came for a kingdom, so let me show you a kingdom. Look, there is real pretty buildings and lots of money and, and there's lots of stuff and there's all these riches. Didn't you come for a kingdom? And, and why are you here suffering? Your dad, God sent you here to die. You might as well just bow down to me so that I can hook you up. But what Jesus understood that he could not trade what he really wanted for what he wanted to write now. He couldn't trade this idea that riches aren't actually riches. Riches are people. So Jesus had the end game in mind. And remember that transforming your finances is having the end game in mind. It's a new lifestyle. It's a new way of living. So Jesus looks at Satan and says, bro, you don't get it. I'll never bow down to you. I live on what God feeds. I didn't come for a kingdom of riches. I came for a kingdom full of people. That is true riches. And what defeats shame is when we say, listen, I don't got all the money in the world, but I've got accountability. I've got friendship. I've got life. I've got vulnerability. I've got people who love me. I've got a church who cares. For That's true riches. And if you look around and you don't have all the stuff, but you got people, you got it all. You got it all. And Jesus is going, I, I came for my people. And what the scriptures are saying, if you don't steward what you've been given unrighteous, man, and the money, the resources, how can you be trusted with true riches? And shame will say, well, I've not been good at these other areas, so how can I be good with people? The spirit of mammon is a liar. The spirit of entitlement is a liar. The spirit of shame is a liar. God's got you. And it's time to treat people and treat your resources and your money the right yeah. way. Yeah. Now, as we close this service... I want to invite all of our ushers forward and I don't want anybody moving because I'm not finished preaching. I just want you to prepare your heart for our tithe, for the offering. But I want to give one more final illustration so ushers at every location you can move. And I was just thinking, I keep bothering my wife, you know this, for one more kid. Some people want four more years, I want one more kid. Now, she's saying she's not ready because our kid is a little extra. He takes after her, you know. I'm like, I just want one more, you know. Like, Christmas is going to be so fun when we're old and they have to buy us things and feed us and, and change our diapers and stuff. Like, I just want one more, you know. And uh, too far, sorry. But anyway, but I just keep thinking, like, I was so excited when... when, when I knew we were having a boy and then, but I was thinking like, how cool would it be to have like a little powerhouse girl? Come on somebody, you know? Like my little girl, she'll be the first female president. I'm just saying, okay? Like, like I would love to have just this powerhouse lady. And, um, but you know, I, then I think, and I don't know why I'm romanticizing in all these ways, but I just think like, if I have a little girl though, like someday some ratty little goofy little boy is gonna show up at my house asking her out. And that's going to be a rough day. You know what I'm saying? I don't even have a girl, and I'm thinking about these things. But listen, I was thinking, like, if true riches are people, and this ratty little boy, I'm sure he's good. He'll be a great guy, I declare. But, like, if this boy is not generous, if he... If, if the spirit of mammon and entitlement and shame is all over his money and his life, if he can't manage earthly riches well, why would he manage true riches well? Like, why would I give him my daughter, which would be true riches? Why would I do that if he doesn't manage his earthly riches well? He's not going to manage what somebody else's. Why would he manage... What was or what is mine? And you have to understand something. Listen to me. When we receive offering, when we put God first with our resources, with our earthly resources, we're actually helping true riches take place in our city and in our world. I say it like this. Listen to this. I say it like this. Heaven is being populated and hell is being plundered by our offerings. 
Because when we give, people are getting saved. So listen to this. We give physical riches on earth so we can have true riches in heaven. That's what we do when we give. We're literally saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. I trust you with my earthly riches, so please, will you now trust me as you promise with true riches, with people, with relationship, with life, with hope. I, I want to see your kingdom come, and when we give, that's exactly what's taking place. True riches is what this thing is all about, and the only thing that breaks these spirits like it does is to say, God, this is not mine, it's yours. Generosity breaks the chain of mammon, entitlement, and shame. That's how it works. That's how it works. And God loves you. And he wants to pour more over you no matter where you're at in your life. But it starts by trusting him first. Come on, do you, first, do you believe that today? Can we give God a praise, Center City? Can we give God a praise? We're going to receive our offering today. I'm going to pray. And then after the bucket passes you, then you can stand and continue to worship with us. But let me pray for you, Father. Thank you for our church. Thank you for what you're doing in our city. Thank you that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the provider. You never fail. You never miss it. You never make a mistake. We trust you today with our earthly riches because we want to see true riches here on earth and in heaven. God, we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give.